The scriptures tell us of the importance of studying God's Word. The psalmist writes, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto thy path. In another place, he continues, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. We at Calvary Chapel Worship Center believe in teaching through the Bible in its entirety. May your faith be increased at the hearing of God's word. Here now is Pastor Rich. <laughs> Chapter 15, I was running up the stairs and running back. Ah, let's pray. Father, thank you so much just for the opportunity to just receive of your word. And Lord, it is our delight to understand that the word of God is the word of truth. And Lord, that you would use these things in our lives. We understand, Lord, you transform us. So we pray that you would do that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. It's hard to pray when you're out of breath. I shouldn't have tried it. I shouldn't have tried it. Chapter 15, verse 1. We're studying, of course, through the kings of the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Remember, of course, it's divided now because of Solomon turning his heart away from the Lord. And so when we get to this chapter, really what we are seeing is that the kings are just, especially in the north, are walking away from the Lord. And so what we are seeing is Israel in its great heyday. And oh, was it a significant kingdom at that time. And then what you see is step by step by step, Israel becoming less and less significant and powerful and blessed. Less so, less so, less so. Because they are walking away from the Lord. They've been compromising. And the more they compromise, the more the result is bad. The more the result in their life is evil. And there is a predictable pattern for all of us to understand. There is a predictable pattern there. And if we can understand that pattern, man, there is a blessing in store for us when we understand that there is a God in heaven who is sovereign over all. And that really what we need to understand is that he wants to pour out his favor. He wants to pour out his blessing. And the greatest thing that we can do is walk in the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. For there is life. There is life. And I pray that we would really understand that and see it. Now, when we get to chapter 15, we're going to see a lot of different names of kings. And, you know, we're going to jump from the north to the south, from the south to the north. So bear with me as we go through these things. And they're there for our understanding and our learning, okay? But it is sometimes difficult to follow all these names we're not familiar with. And are we talking about the north or the south? But let's bear with it, and you'll see that there's a great blessing as we do. Now, in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, he was the first king under the divided kingdom in the north. He was the son of Nebat, that Abijam became king over Judah in the south. He reigned three years in Jerusalem, there in the south, and his mother's name was Mecca, the daughter of Abishalom. And he walked in all of the sins of his father, which he had committed before him. And his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, like the heart of his father David. And there's that comparison. So commonly, they will compare the heart of this king or that one to David, because David, in I know that David had sins, famous ones, but David never turned his heart away from God. He did follow after, and even when he sinned and was broken because of that, it would draw him back toward the Lord. Never went to the Baals, never went to the Ashtoreth, never went to the Molech. David never left his God, and that's important. But, verse 4, but for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem to raise up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. David had promised. God had promised David that. Because David did what was right in the sight of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except, except. We see it, God puts his, his people out there honestly doesn't hide their humanity. He puts it out there, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. Tells us there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life, and the rest of the acts of Abijam, 
and all they did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? We have that. We'll study that soon. There was war between Abijam and Jeroboam. Now, Abijam then slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And so Asa comes along, and Asa, his son, became king in his place. So, in the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel in the north, Asa became or reigned as king of Judah in the south. And he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Mekah, the daughter of Abishalom. And Asa did what was right. Ah, a nice bright spot. Wonderful. This is wonderful. There's one who did right in the sight of the Lord like David, his father. Now, there's a little interesting snippet. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Understanding that God sees our lives. And really, when we live our lives, we live our lives before him. Man, if we could live our lives before God, it would make such a difference. So many people think that they're somehow, if they turn their back on God, that God doesn't see what they're doing. And now how, how does that work exactly? That is our own minds trying to convince us that we aren't really being seen by God because, you know, we're not really watching what God or caring what God is doing. We've turned away. Surely God has turned away from us. God never turns away. And so when we live before Him... Before him we live and move and have our being, the scripture says. And so Asa did it. Verse 12, he put away the male cult prostitutes. Good. Because that's just flat wrong. Put away the male cult prostitutes from the land and removed all the idols which his fathers had made. A lot could be said about that, but I think it speaks plainly. And he also removed Mecca, his mother, from being queen mother. What? Apparently, his father had allowed this woman to have some kind of throne. So she was like a queen mother. And he said, no more. He removed queen mother because she had made a horrid image as an Asherah. Asherah is the female deity, the female goddess of sexuality. And he said he made a hoarded, this woman made a hoarded image. And so Asa cut it down. Get that thing out, cut it down, burn it. And he burned it in the brook Kidron, just down uh, from Jerusalem to the east. But the high places were not taken away. But nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly devoted to the Lord all his days. And he brought into the house of the Lord the dedicated things of his father and his own dedicated things, silver and gold and utensils. Now there was war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, all their days. And Basha, king of Israel, we kind of jump to the north for a bit. Basha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and fortified Ramah. Today we call it Ramallah. In order to prevent anyone from going out or coming in to Asa, king of Judah. So this is what Asa did. Asa took all the silver and the gold which were left in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the treasuries of the king's house, and he delivered them into the hand of his servants. And so King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tabramon, king of Hezion, king of, Arabron, of Ar Aram, excuse me, who lived in Damascus, saying, let there be a treaty between you and me, as between my father and your father. Behold, I have sent you a present of silver and gold. Go, break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. So Ben-Hadad listened to King Asa and sent the commanders of his army against the cities of Israel and conquered Ejon, Dan, Abel-Beth, Mekah, and Chinneroth, besides all the land of Naphtali. And it came about when Basha heard of this, that he ceased fortifying Ramah and remained in Tirzah. Then King Asa made a proclamation to all Judah. None was exempt. And they carried away the stones of Ramah and its timber with which Basha had built. And King Asa built with them Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah. Let's just stop for, for a second. You see what this man did? He took some money, gold, silver, whatever, and he sent it up to the king, which was above north of Israel above, and he said, do this, we had a treaty, my father and your father, 
let's renew that treaty, and you attack Israel for me. After all, the best defense is a good offense. So you create an offensive action on the north, and that will cause him to withdraw from me here in the south. So this man said, yes, I'll take your money. Let's do that. And so there was this attack. He withdrew. And then look at that, and you think, hey, it worked. It worked. That must have been a good thing, right? Until you get to the book of Chronicles, where God actually corrects Asa for this. You didn't trust me, now did you? You instead, you went and you made some kind of treaty with some foreign nation, and you didn't really rely on the Lord. And this was a lesson that Asa needed to learn. See, I think we also need to learn that lesson, that we can trust in the Lord, that we, through our own clever strategies, may not make the right choices. What we need is to trust the Lord and to follow the ways of the Lord, because God had said in His Word, you shall make no treaty with them. And so here we really get that kind of that word of wisdom for our own lives. Hey, trust in the Lord and don't make treaties, you know, and these agreements and these strategies that seem clever in our own eyes, but they're not wise in God's eyes because they don't rely and trust on the provision of God. Let's keep our eyes on the sufficiency of God, who God is and not on our own clever mechanisms and machinations of what we're going to do to come and bring about our own results. Amen? There's a great lesson. There really is a great lesson for us in that. Verse 23, Now, the rest of the acts of Asa and all his might and all that he did and the cities which he built, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? We have that. But in the time of his old age, he was diseased in his feet. And Asa slept with his fathers. He died from that disease. Asa slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. And Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place. Now we turn to the north. Now Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, became king over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah. And he reigned over Israel two years, that's all. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in the ways of his father, and in his sin, which he made Israel sin. You know, it's always a sad commentary when you hear someone say, he walked in the sins of his father. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? He walked in the sins of his father. Now, you look at that, and you say, well, the poor boy, you know, he didn't have good upbringing. His father was evil, and so it's understandable that he should walk in the sins of his father. And we probably could understand that from a human perspective. But I'm convinced that God gives each one an opportunity to revive his heart and to turn his life away from the sins of his father. And, and I can understand. I relate. My father, I, you know my story. If many of you have been around a while, you know my story. My father was an alcoholic, abusive to my mother. All of those things. The statistics should have said that I should follow in the sins of my father. But we don't have to follow in the sins of our Father, do we? God is the transforming one. We can be set free from the bondages. If your father was an alcoholic, you don't have to be an alcoholic. If your father abused your mother, you don't have to abuse your wife. We can be transformed by the power of the Lord who sets us free. And he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen? In fact, it's interesting because it says of King Asa, he didn't walk in the sins of his father. So therefore, we have that great testimony. You don't have to walk in the sins of your father. You can be free. And you know, I, I got to tell you, there was a time in my life when I, I had a, I guess, a crisis where I had to make a crossroad decision. And I came to a point where I, I said to the Lord, and I remember saying it just with the determination in my heart, no more. It's going to end here. It's not going to pass from that generation to that generation to that generation to that generation. I'm not going to pass that to my kids. No more. It ends here. Amen. There's a decision that I think we've got to come to where we drive in a stake in the ground where we say, no more, it ends here. I don't have to walk in the sins of my father. How is that possible? Because you can have a new father. That's why. 
Who is your new father? Your father in heaven. He will be a father to you. And you will be sons and daughters to him, says the Lord God Almighty. There is good news in that. There is freedom in that. There is release in that. There's power in that to understand that he is a father who is a perfect father. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And I look at that and I find there is power to understand. When we read, he walked in the sins of his father, may that be a, a reminder to us, hey, it doesn't have to be that way. I can make a decision to let it end because the power and the freedom of Christ is offered to everyone. I can stand on that promise. Amen? So, it tells us he walked in the sins of his father. Where did we leave off? Verse what? 27. Then Bishop... Then, I lost my place, that was crazy. Then, Basha, the son of Hija of the house of Issachar, conspired against them. So, this is interesting. So, Jeroboam passed the rulership to his son, but at some point it ended, and it ended here. Basha, the son of Ahijah, of the house of Issachar, conspired against them, and Basha struck him down at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines, while Nadab and all Israel were laying siege to Gibbethon. So Basha killed him in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his place. It came about then, as soon as he was king, he struck down all the household of Jeroboam, which was common uh, as the transition from king to king. If it was outside the family, it was a common thing to do. But what's interesting is that God had promised Jeroboam that if he had followed the ways of the Lord, that he would have a son to sit on his throne as David also did. Interesting promise, isn't it? But Jeroboam did not walk after the Lord as he was asked to do. And so here, within only two generations, his family line is cut off. And so the word of the Lord is absolutely sure. You can't wrestle with God. You can't thwart the will of God. And so we see it. As soon as he was king, he struck down all the house of Jeroboam. He did not leave to Jeroboam any persons alive until he had destroyed them, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoke by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite. In other words, the prophecy fulfilled. And because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned, and which he made Israel to sin, because of his provocation with which he provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger, all of that happened. Now, the rest of the acts of Nadab and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? That one we don't have. We have the Chronicle of the Kings of Judah. We don't have the Chronicle of the Kings of Israel. And there was war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, all their days. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, Basha, the son of Ahijah, became king over all Israel at Tirzah and reigned 24 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam, and in his sin, which he had made Israel to sin. Chapter 16. Now the word of the Lord came to Jehu, son of Hanani, against Basha, saying, Inasmuch as I exalted you from the dust, and I made you leader of my people Israel, but you have walked in the way of Jeroboam, and you have made my people Israel to sin, provoking me to anger with their sin. Behold, I will consume Basha and his house, and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam. He gave him an opportunity. He didn't take it. Anyone of Basha who dies in the city, the dogs will eat. And anyone of his who dies in the field, the birds of the heavens will eat. Now the rest of the acts of Basha and what he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And Basha slept with his fathers, was buried at Tirzah, and Elah his son became king in his place. Moreover, the word of the Lord through the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, also came against Basha and his household, both because of all the evil which he did in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger with the work of his hands in being like the house of Jeroboam, and because he struck it. In the 26th year of Asa, who was king of Judah, Elah, the son of Basha, became king over Israel at Tirzah and reigned two years, that's all. And then his servant Zimri, now catch this, this is kind of some drama, it, it, 
which is interesting because what you really see is just the melting down of leadership and the anarchy that follows because people's hearts, as they walk away from the Lord, confusion and chaos is the result of it. Confusion and chaos. If someone's life turns into confusion and chaos, more than likely you can look and see that they've walked away from God. And so we see it. Zimri went, struck him, put him to death in the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, and became king in his place. A little coup. And it came about when he became king that as soon as he sat on the throne that he killed all the household of Basha. And he did not leave a single male, just like Basha did. And neither of his relatives or of his friends. Thus Zimri destroyed all the household of Basha according to the word of the Lord which he spoke against Basha through Jehu the prophet. For all the sins of Basha and the sins of Elah his son, which they sinned, which they made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord to anger with their idols. There's a theme. Now the rest of the acts of Elah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? In the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri reigned seven days. How's that for a rulership reign? Seven days. He reigned seven days at Tirzah. Now the people were camped against Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. And the people who were camped heard it and said, Zimri has conspired and struck down the king. So therefore all Israel made Omri, commander of the army, king over Israel that day in the camp. Then Omri and all Israel with him went up at Gibbethon, or from Gibbethon, and they besieged Tirzah. Well, it came about when Zimri saw that the city was taken, that he went into the citadel of the king's house, and he burned the king's house over him with fire, and he died, committed suicide. Because of the sins which he sinned, doing evil in the sight of the Lord, walking in the way of Jeroboam, and in his sin, which he did, and making Israel to sin. Now, the rest of the acts of Zimri and his conspiracy, which he carried out, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? Then the people of Israel were divided then into two parts. This is just chaos, isn't it? Half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Ganath, to make him king. Other half followed Omri. But the people who followed Omri prevailed over the people who followed Timni, the son of Ganath. And Timni died and Omri became king. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri became king over Israel and reigned 12 years. He reigned six years at Tirzah. And then he bought a hill. He bought the hill Samaria from Shemer from two, for two talents of silver. And he built on the hill and he named the city which he built Samaria after the name of Shemer. And he owned the, who, who was the owner of the hill. And Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord and acted even more wickedly than all who were before him. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sins, which he made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord God of Israel with their idols. Now the rest of the acts of Omri, which he did, and his might, which he showed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So, Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria. And Ahab, now we come to Ahab. Ahab, his son, became king in his place. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. Now, it tells us something important. Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more. I mean, we're going from worse to worse to now terrible. More than all who were before him. And it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel. <laughs> you guys are good. That he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. And he went to serve Baal and worship them. See, here comes Ahab, and we've been studying on the, the weekend services about Elijah. And Elijah is this prophet who's going to show up in just a moment. And Ahab is the king in the north, and he has this woman Jezebel. And Jezebel is a wicked woman. And interestingly, he says, as if it were a trivial thing to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, this man married Jezebel. Which is to say, that apparently is just as bad as walking in the sins of Jeroboam. This woman was a wicked woman. 
And in fact, if a woman is called a Jezebel, if you, if, don't ever do that. Don't, don't ever say, oh, that woman, she is a Jezebel. Because that is the, I mean, that is a, that is a really bad insult. You say that to a woman, you know, she's a Jezebel. Don't, that is a harsh word. It's a harsh word. And so this Jezebel, and you see as we go through the story, is a wicked, wicked woman. And so, not only did Ahab marry her, but he went after the Baals all out. And she went after the Ashtoreth. Now, see, the Baals would be the male god of power and of sex. She going after the female goddess of sexuality. And all of the groves. The groves were these stands of trees where they would put the Asherah in the middle and see all of this debauchery and sexuality would happen in the groves. You, you with me? And it just was getting really, really bad. And so this is the condition. This is just meltdown. We're going from chaos to anarchy to debauchery to licentiousness. And you can just see the whole society melting down. Don't you wonder sometimes what this earth would be like if there were no good people on it at all? And, and you see it. You see the melting down. And so really what we need to understand is that the flesh that we carry is a, is, we need the Lord. Can we just say that? We need the Lord. We need the Lord to transform us. And, and we need the Lord to change our hearts. We need the Lord's spirit to be our life. For what we see here is what we all would be. If it were not for the Lord transforming and touching us and saving us. And so it tells us this, that he married this woman, Jezebel, and he went after the Baals, verse 32. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab also made the Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings who were before him. And in his days, this is a little side note, but of interest. In his days, Heel, the Bethelite, built Jericho. This is just an interesting little side note placed in here. Why is it placed in here? It's helpful for us to have because it brings us all the way back to Joshua. And if you remember when Joshua was leading Israel into the land of promise, that the first city that they defeated was Jericho. And, Je and Joshua had made a declaration that Jericho would not be rebuilt. Do not rebuild Jericho. And that whoever would rebuild it, at the laying of its foundation, will lose his first son, and the setting of his gates will lose his last son. Run the tape all the way forward to this verse. And it's given to us to help us understand that the word of God does not fail. What did Jesus say? Not one jot, not one tittle will pass away until every word of the Lord is fulfilled. This is given to us to help us understand it. He yelled, the Bethelite built Jericho. What? Are you crazy? And he laid its foundations with the loss of Abiram, his firstborn. And he set up its gates with the loss of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Interesting side note. But now we come to chapter 17. On the scene comes Elijah. Here's the interesting thing, isn't it? Here the nation has got to its darkest point ever. Israel is, I just described it, how anarchy, chaos, confusion, sexuality, debauchery, it was just going meltdown, and here comes a man of God. How would you like to be a prophet in those conditions? I mean, here comes Elijah in the worst conditions possible, and he stands up to be a man who makes a difference in his generation. Here comes Elijah the Tishbite. We don't know exactly what Tishbite means, either a place or his father, who was uh, of the settlers of Gilead. Gilead being on the eastern side of the Jordan. That belonged to Israel, of course. And it tells us, that he came to Ahab, and that's, all, that's the only introduction we have of Elijah. We don't know his mother, his father, we don't know his background. 
All we know of where he stands, he stands before Ahab, and he gives one sentence, a one-sentence declaration. He comes to Ahab and he says, As Jehovah, who is the God of Israel, let me remind you. As Jehovah, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, surely there will be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And then he left. One sentence. And he is fulfilling a prophecy. The prophecy given in Deuteronomy. If my people will love, will love their God and will walk in his ways, there will be dew from heaven. There will be rain. There will be crops. There will be abundance. There will be blessings. My favor will rest on that land. But if my people will turn their back on their God and they go after the world and they go after the Baals and they go after the Asherah and they go after the Molech, let it be known now. Moses said to Israel many years before, let it be known now that if my people do that, there will be no rain. The sky will be like bronze and the ground will be like iron. And it rain, It will rain dust. How about that? It won't be rain of water. It will be rain of dust. And so Elijah stands before him and says, this is the word of Jehovah. There will be no rain until I say. And he, he leaves. Elijah is a powerful prophet. And it's interesting because Elijah becomes significant pr prophetically. You roll the tape forward and you see that in the book of Malachi, it was prophesied that before the coming of the Messiah, Elijah would come. So there's an interesting prophecy that before the coming of the Messiah, Elijah would come. And so then when you get to the time of Jesus and you look at John the Baptist, remember that the angel Gabriel had said to Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, that he would have a son, that his wife in her old age, would bear a son. And the word of the Lord was, through Gabriel, that he would come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And so, interestingly, when John, after, you know, John, in many ways, looked like Elijah, because, you know, he was hairy. Elijah was a hairy, you know, fellow, and, uh, you know, was kind of rough looking, wore rough clothes. And here comes John the Baptist, kind of rough looking, and, uh, and, and, you know, came walking in the desert. And so here John the Baptist came and we declared repentance. Israel, repent, and he brought them back. And the scripture says that he will come, Elijah will come and draw the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the hearts of the children back to the fathers. So, John the Baptist was arrested, and then he sent some of his men, his disciples, to, to ask of Jesus, are you the one? Are you the one, John said, or we should look for another? Jesus responded and said, you tell John, you tell John, the blind see, the lame walk, the dead are raised. You tell John that, and blessed is he you know, who believes. And so he goes back with his message. Afterward, the disciples said, they asked him about John. And Jesus said, surely Elijah must come before the Messiah. And he said, if you will hear it, John is Elijah. Now, we're glad we have that word of Gabriel that he came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. For on the Mount of Transfiguration, remember when Jesus was transformed, Elijah himself actually did appear along with Moses. Moses